I'm Tim Newbold, I'm based at University College London. What we mean when we say biodiversity is the variety of life on the planet, animals, plants, fungi and all the other species that are out there. The big international biodiversity report that came out in May of this year estimated around a million species are likely to be threatened with extinction as a result of human actions. We know that animals and plants also support us as humans. Pollinators for many of our crops, plants to ensure that soils remain healthy, biodiversity loss has reached such a level that we can no longer be confident that it will continue to support those vital roles on which we rely, such as pollination. Every two years, the World Wide Fund for Nature and the Zoological Society of London compile the Living Planet Report, where they assess the status of biodiversity. In 2018, last year, they estimated that animal populations have declined by around three-fifths since 1970. Insects have started to make the news. The situation may be even worse when we look at insects than for other groups. The past couple of years, there have been some big landmark studies that have highlighted the large declines that we're seeing among insects. And of course, this is important for us because actually it's the insects that do the most important jobs for us, um, like pollination and waste removal um, within natural systems. If you see this no treating symbol, please don't share that information. Habitat loss is, is causing the biggest declines in biodiversity. It's pretty clear when you, know, you look at an image like this, the profound effects that we have on habitats when we take natural forests and, and turn it into farmland. And if we look at a map of the world, what you can see is a very large amount of the world's land services used up for human farming. And it's around a half. And what happens if we turn natural habitat, forests, grasslands into farmland? If we go to this farmland and we might see three quarters of the, of the animals and plants that were there are no longer there. They're the first step on the road towards extinction of species. And if we look across the whole world, where we still have a lot of natural habitats, biodiversity is doing okay, and the places where you have a lot of farmland and biodiversity is doing badly. If we average all of those things out, what we see is a, a loss of a one-fifth of biodiversity across the whole world. Not all animals and plants do badly. If you go to any city or farmland, and there are hundreds of pigeons and rats. And you might have noticed as well, there are a lot of green woodpeckers around now. They're doing very well. We are very interested in what it is about these animals and plants that makes them do very well, which ones do very well and which ones do badly. We look at all of these animals and plants that are found all over the world or, or over very large parts of the world and to take animals and plants that are found in very small areas. This is a gecko that's found in a couple of tiny little patches in Madagascar. So all of the animals and plants that are found in small areas, yeah, they're going down by around a half on average. And these sorts of animals and plants that are found all over the place, they tend to be doing very well, and they're going up by about a half. And this is a little bit like, you know, what you see with, with our high street, small shops, unique local shops are being replaced by large chains. They say the same things with banks. Part of the world's money is now sort of dominated by a few large banks. And this is important. In the same way that in the financial crisis, the shops rippled through the system much quicker because everything is within a few large banks, you know, we know that the same thing happens in natural systems, but if we have lots of these sorts of things that are found everywhere, that the shops ripple through the system much more quickly than in the, the natural state when we have lots of these sort of unique animals and plants. And another reason that we should be worried about this as humans is that many of these animals and plants that do very well with human activities are those things that carry human diseases. You know, while most animals and plants are lost when we turn natural habitats into farmland or cities, but those animals and plants that carry human disease do really, really well. Things like bats, rodents, including this rat that carries Lassa fever. And these things can go up by as much as 150%. You know, habitat loss currently is having the biggest effect on biodiversity. But of course now climate change is becoming an increasing issue. These are some graphics that are made by a climate scientist from Reading called Ed Hawkins. From left to right, you've got a series of years. Bluer colours are colder years, red colours are hotter years. So this shows very clearly the hottest years have been in the past 10 or 15 years. This is the Bramble K mosaic-tailed rat, the first mammal that has been driven to extinction by climate change. It was found on this tiny speck of land called Bramble K, which is just off the Great Barrier Reef. And as a result of climate change and the consequent sea level rise, the habitat was lost and it went extinct. Bumblebees are interesting. They don't tend to do too badly with habitat loss, but they seem to be very sensitive to climate change. They are important pollinators of many of the 
crops that we like to eat. So what we're finding over the last hundred or so years, bumblebees have declined as a result of just climate change by around 4% across Europe. But it's worth remembering that so far we've experienced a relatively small amount of climate change and you know, we're already seeing these sorts of declines. Climate change and habitat loss are happening alongside one another. And we're interested in how these things might combine together and what that might mean for biodiversity. When the climate warms, animals and plants need to be able to move. They need to be able to move towards the poles and they need to be able to move up mountains in order to move to cooler places. Now, we've had periods of rapid climate change in the past, but at that time, you know, animals and plants were able to move through natural habitat, landscapes that were entirely covered in natural habitat. The problem that we have now with current climate change is that we've chopped down a lot of that natural habitat. And we know that agricultural habitats in our cities are you know, not able to sustain a majority of species. So this creates a problem for animals and plants to be able to move with, with climate change. And what makes matters worse is that those places with farms and cities are hotter and drier than natural habitats. So you probably notice if you walk in a forest, you come out into a farmland, you immediately notice it's hotter and it's drier. This means that this is adding to climate change. As there's climate change happening across the whole planet, but in farmland and cities, there's even more heating and there's more drying. And so what this means is that when we look at what effect this has on biodiversity, it's that we see something like four times bigger declines in biodiversity when we think about the way that habitat loss and climate change combine together. So what we find now for, for bumblebees is that over those past hundred or so years, that now you know, habitat loss and climate change together have been responsible for around 16% decline in bumblebees. And we think that probably things are worse than that, but the data suggests that things are worse than that. And one of the reasons is that we're not taking into account pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and other sorts of intensification of agriculture. This is where things start to get quite alarming. You know, we can predict what might happen into the future. We're expecting more habitat loss to happen, and particularly we're expecting a lot more climate change to happen. And so what we find now is that if we carry on as we are, we're pursuing the world with fossil fuels, what we call business as usual. We predict that there will be 60% declines in bumblebees across Europe by the end of this century. If we meet the Paris Climate Agreement and we keep warming to more like one and a half or two degrees, things are a bit better. But because of these combined effects of climate change and habitat loss, we're still predicting that there will be 40% declines of bumblebees. And where these losses will be felt is quite different depending where in Europe. There are places towards the north do a bit better because if bumblebees are able to move through those habitats they'll reach the northern areas and those may do okay may even actually gain but in the south we're predicting very large declines even complete losses in some places we know that there are this whole suite of crops but for which bumblebees are a very important pollinator many of them are grown in southern europe and the mediterranean region which is exactly where we're predicting those largest losses of bumblebee species a lot of the work that we've done on biodiversity in the past 25 years has been about looking at what's happened, documenting the losses that we've seen. Or more recently, when we've been trying to make predictions, it's been along the lines of, you know, if this happens, then this is what will happen to biodiversity. You know, if we carry on on our business as usual trajectory, fossil fuel development, this might happen. If we stick to the Paris Climate Agreement, then it might be better, this might happen. We've also been starting to switch the way that we approach these predictions. Instead of saying, if this happens, then this is what will happen to biodiversity. We started saying, well, OK, let's assume that we want biodiversity to improve. This is the future that we want to achieve for biodiversity. So if that's our target, what do we need to do to get there? This sort of idea has been around in climate science for a while. So people have been saying, well, if we want to keep warming within two degrees, within one and a half degrees, what do we need to do? And so this has led to the idea of what are called climate wedges. So a suite of actions that if we adopted them, then we could move towards a world of two degrees, one and a half, things around technology, preservation of natural habitat, and behavioural changes, you know, such as dietary change. And what other biodiversity researchers have found is that you know, just looking at the impacts of climate change on biodiversity, that if we were to follow these sorts of actions, if we were to move from a world of fossil fuels to something where we could meet the Paris Climate Agreement, that we could reduce the numbers of species very badly impacted by climate change from around a half to around a fifth. And we started to think about doing the same sort of thing for habitat loss, to say, well, OK, if we want to reverse biodiversity declines, what do we need to do? What are the biodiversity wedges? 
protecting natural habitats, farming in a better way, changing people's diets, of course, reducing food waste. But if we were to put into a place a suite of actions, so preserving natural habitats, changing people's diets, farming more efficiently, that we could actually reverse biodiversity declines because of habitat loss. One of the sort of new things that's emerging is that when we look at how climate change and habitat loss are combining, that the situation is much worse than if we look at just habitat loss or just climate change. And we still don't know what the solution to this is. You know, we're predicting very, very large declines of biodiversity when we think about how climate change and habitat loss are combining with one another. And we don't yet know quite how big the actions are that will be needed if we were to try and reverse biodiversity declines when we take into account both of these things going on at once. We have some ideas. One thing that is clear is that you know, if animals and plants are going to be able to respond to climate change, that they need to be able to move through natural habitat. And so creating corridors of natural habitats through landscapes, restoring habitats, is certainly going to help animals and plants to move um, in response to climate change. Not far from here in Cambridgeshire, this is the Great Fen project. The plan is to link up a lot of the natural habitats that are found in the Cambridgeshire Fens to create these more natural, restored, connected landscapes. Just really to finish then and returning to this Bramble Cave mosaic tailed rats. We're making better and better predictions about what's going to happen to biodiversity. We know that the effects of habitat loss alone are having a very large impact. The effects of climate change you know, has already been seen in the extinction of species like this rat. And we're particularly concerned now, you know, that habitat loss and climate change are combining together to have even greater effects. We're starting to come up with solutions to try and reduce climate change reduce habitat loss. We're still trying to work out what the solutions are to try and deal with both things together. Certainly, you know, there's going to be big actions that are needed to avoid many more extinctions of animals and plants. Thank you very much. If you'd like to get in touch, 